How you doing, everybody? We're going to have another sermon here, another lesson that you can use. Uh, you can do this uh, in a home Bible study and watch the video and then uh, discuss it with your friends and your family or neighbors and um, use this to learn from. And there are some, there'll be several things we do learn about this. And the title of the lesson is uh, Lessons Learned from Balaam. <clears throat> Okay, Numbers 22, 1 through 41. If you want to grab your Bibles and read along with me, you can. Uh, so um, uh, the, the version I'm using to, to teach from in this lesson is uh, the King James Version. And so uh, some of the old language, we, we may have to explain some of that as we go along. But see, most people just remember the donkey who spoke. When you talk about Balaam, that's about the only thing they get out of this story is the donkey talked. And so we're, there, there's more to it than that. <clears throat> so we could call this a lesson on how not to treat a donkey. Uh, and okay, you can chuckle all you want, but people would rather this be the point of the lesson rather than what the lesson we are really supposed to learn. And so, yeah, that'd be a whole lot easier, just a story on how not to treat a donkey. But we got spiritual thoughts in mind, and that's what we want to present in this lesson. See, the lives of Old Testament characters provide both positive and negative examples. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 through 11 talks about the fact that, yeah, the things that happened to the people of old, I mean, what they did and how they were punished for their bad mistakes is something we should learn from and not do the same mistakes. And Paul said the things written beforehand were written for our instruction or our learning, Romans 15 and verse 4. So Balaam was an unusual person who provided one of those negative examples from which we can learn. And of course, you're going to watch, you're, we're going to go along and start not, well, there, there's, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? And, the, and there's going to be some things that Balaam does do right in the beginning, but then he changes his mind and does things that are wrong. So we're, we're going to notice some things. And yes, some of the things they said in the beginning, yeah, we, we should be following that good example, but not following the negative example. So uh, here in Numbers 22 is the first time he is mentioned in the scriptures. And his name also occurs three times in the New Testament. And those three occasions uh, do not speak very highly of him. And uh that he is mentioned a few times in the Old Testament, uh, later on in Numbers, and then in a couple of the Psalms, uh, they, may, they do the recount, uh, a, a recount of history, whereas the, uh, the people of the, um, the Israelite nation were going into the Promised Land. And of course, Balaam, they had to deal with him along the way. So let's set up the scenario that we're going to get into before we start reading. <clears throat> After about 40 years in the wilderness, Israel was on the way to Canaan. They were finally going to go there. And so they had defeated Sihon's army, who had previously conquered Moab. We read about Numbers 21, 26, and Og, the king of Bashan, east of Jordan. I mean, they had conquered him as well. And they were encamped in the plain of Moab, intending to pass it around it to Canaan that we read about in Deuteronomy 2 and verse 9. Now, who is Balaam real quick? Well, to one, the one to whom Balak sent messengers to hire him to come and curse Israel. Yeah, we could say that. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves right now, but that, that was his purpose of calling Balak. All right, so... He was the son of Beor, who lived in Pethor near the Euphrates River. Now that that's over there in the land of the Assyrians and the Chaldeans. And so certainly uh, not a land of the Israelites or there weren't any Israelites over there at that time. And so uh, he had a reputation as being a prophet and a pretty sound prophet. Notice that uh, he was a prophet of God. You know, 2 Peter 2, 16 calls him a prophet of God. And God did speak to Balaam several times in, in our story. We're going to see where God speaks to Balaam and then an angel speaks to Balaam. Uh, and Balaam spoke great truths. Um, and we can read this in uh, uh, 
Numbers 23, 19, and Numbers 24, 17. And uh, Balak had confidence in him because of his accuracy in his prophecies. I mean, you, you had to go far and wide to find somebody who was actually accurate in their predictions. And so we see that in verse six. And so let, let's get going. All right. Numbers 22, begin verse one. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side, Jordan, by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, now shall this company look up all that are around about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. So come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I want that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand, and they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. All right, Balaam's first response. It appears wise and honorable. Let's notice. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. Balaam told the messengers to stay overnight so he could ask God about this matter. Because it was kind of wise to check with God before you actually do something. You might need his permission. And that's why a lot of times it's wise to sometimes pray about a matter and not just be doing something because we're selfishly want to do something, but yet we need to pray about it. And who knows, somehow the answer might be revealed to us. <clears throat> so God came unto Balaam and said, what men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto them, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covered the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people for they are blessed. Okay, so God has spoken now. So Balaam said God would not allow him to go. That's what he told the people. And so we see that. Uh, but he only told the first part of God's message. <clears throat> Notice as we read. And had he told it all, it might have changed Balak's plans and Balak probably would have looked for somebody else. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, get you into your land for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. <clears throat> I mean, that was it. Hey, God has spoken. I'm not going to go. And the princes of Moab rose up and they went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. For we later, we will later on learn that this left the door open for Balaam to profit financially. And whether that was in his intention or not, we really don't know, but maybe you can surprise because that's what it says in the new Testament for wages. Balaam did some of these things. All right. So, and Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. And that was the right answer. Yes, that was the right answer. But let's keep reading. 
Verse 19, now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also here this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. Okay, folks, this is where Balaam did wrong. God said at one time, that's all that's necessary. That's all they need. And so he's going to ask God again if he can go. And so, I mean, a lot of people are like that. They, they read their Bible and God says, don't do it. And then they, oh, no, no, there's got to be something else there. They're, they're, they're looking for this loophole or something. So maybe in, in his thinking, Balaam thought the word of the Lord had limits on time. So, I mean, from where they were, it, it probably took several weeks between the two events uh, of the first coming and the second coming of these, uh, these uh, emissaries. And, and so uh, several weeks had taken place and now, uh, Balaam, th well, maybe this time he'll change his mind. And so he forgot that God does not change, you know, Malachi three and verse six. And when God speaks, it is for all time. And we know that God's word is final. God's word is the final matter on anything. And that's why we have to respect Bible authority because the Bible actually comes from God. So we're going to notice here. The first time God spoke should have been enough. I think we all can understand that. I think uh, that makes a lot of sense. God said, don't go. And so that was it. And even Balaam responded, well, yeah, yeah, I know God said not to go, but let me think about this. Uh, let me re-examine re -examine this. And so what this, this teaches us that some people are not satisfied with what God has spoken. And we know that's true because people do not like what God says in his Bible. So they, they, they want to change it or they just downright ignore it. And so they want to push for something different. In other words, they're looking for that loophole that uh, they, they suppose is there that they can still get away with it. And people with this attitude, you know, God's going to allow them leeway in what they want to do. But you know what? God is still going to hold them accountable. I mean, that, that they don't realize that, but God will. See, 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, God's even going to allow them to believe the lie. And why? <laughs> okay, doorbell rang, dog went crazy. All right. Um, God allows them to believe the lie who do not love the truth. All right, so 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. All right, Numbers 22, 20 says, and God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. All right, so, I mean, first of all, Balaam shouldn't have wanted to go in the first place, but now God's saying, rise up and go with them. So, I mean, Balaam got his wish more honor, more prestige. Oh yeah. And I even got God's permission to go. So that's what he did. So here, give God here. God gives Balaam permission to go, but limits Balaam on what he can do and say, and you say, okay, well, Balaam can do that. Well, but we soon find that God was upset because Balaam did not listen the first time. Notice in verses 21 and 22, and Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his donkey and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field and Balaam smote the donkey and turned her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And he smote her again. All right. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled and he smote the donkey with a staff. 
And the Lord opened up the mouth of the donkey and sa she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? All right. And Balaam said unto the donkey, because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. And the donkey said unto Balaam, am not I thine donkey upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? He said, no. See, anger, <laughs> Balaam's anger is so wild and crazy. He's carrying on a conversation with a donkey. And it just doesn't, it's not like he's taken aback by that. You can talk. I mean, he just going on. He just filled with so much anger there. Then the Lord opened up the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, wherefore thou hast smitten thine donkey these three times. Behold, I went out to withstand thee because thy way is perverse before me. So see, Balaam had the wrong motives in his heart to begin with. And we recognize that. And the donkey saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. So the donkey was looking out for you. You ought to realize that. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. For I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Thou therefore, if it did displease thee, I will get me back again. In other words, I've done wrong. And that is the right thing to do. If you've done wrong, you got to acknowledge it. I have sinned. You know, that's what Daniel prayed. And that's what Nehemiah prayed. I and my father's house have sinned. We have sinned. The people of God have sinned. And that's what all of us need to acknowledge. I have sinned. We need to do that. And so if you're really that upset with me, I will turn back and go back home. So that's what Balaam said he would do since God was upset. Now there's lessons to be learned from this. And we have quite a few. See, leaving out any part of God's word is dangerous. You leave the door open for possibilities and people think, well, well, maybe there's a loophole somewhere. And, and so... God said it, and that should settle it. Uh, whether you believe it or not, God said it, and that settles it. And so Balaam told the first messengers only part of God's answer. God says, okay, don't go with them because this people are not to be cursed, but they are blessed. And so Balaam didn't tell them that part. And why? Well, we just have to speculate here. And of course, we know that all of God's word is important and needful, Matthew 4, 4. Uh, every word of God, that's how man shall live by every word of God. And so leaving out any part of it was a sign of unfaithfulness in Balaam and all who do it today. You know, in Acts 20 and 27, Paul said he did not shrink from declaring to them the whole counsel of God. Everything that God wants you to know is important and I have delivered it to you. That's what Paul told the, the elders of Ephesus in that, that little speech. And God's will and purpose cannot be thwarted. If God wants something done, that's what's going to happen and nobody can do anything to change that. So not by kings or greedy prophets or anyone else. And those who oppose it do so to their own disappointment, their sorrow, and their destruction. Those who have opposed God have gotten into trouble and really paid the price for it. And we have that story all through the scriptures. And of course, today, people still oppose God. They don't like God. They don't like what God says. And so they oppose him. And guess what? Yeah, they're, they're going to be facing disappointment, sorrow, and destruction when they stand before him in judgment. See, Balaam failed to appreciate his relationship to God. Here's another thing about him. He had a relationship with God. God worked through him and he had a reputation and uh, that should have been all the honor that he needed was the fact that he had a good reputation. But uh, when people offered him money, he, his eyes just kind of focused on the money and he forgot about God and that's not good to do. 
See, he was a prophet through whom God revealed his will. And he was willing to sell his relationship for the wages of unrighteousness. See, Christians should realize the great honor of being a member of God's family. First John 3, 1, we're, we're, we're members of God's family. And it is a great honor. If you're a Christian, you are a member of God's family. And that is an honor and a privilege to be that way. And so, and we should never exchange that honor for the temporary enjoyment of the trash and trinkets of this world. So keep that in mind. We should not be doing it. Matthew 16, 26. Now the motive that led to Balaam's destruction was in seeking wealth and honor. We kind of assume that, and of course, the New Testament kind of confirms that. See, the problem with, with wealth, it will lead many to many different sins. You know, the wages of uh, the riches. I mean, 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. I mean, it can leads to all sorts of sin. The love of money leads to all sorts of sin. And because of the love of money, Achan had to be stoned to death and caused Israel to lose a battle. And Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, he died a leper because he thought he could get some money out of this. And it motivated Judas to, to be, betray the Christ. And of course, money has destroyed the lives of many Christians also. The love of money, the desire for money and riches and wealth and fame. They, they kind of have to, yeah, that, that's what they do. It just destroys their lives. Now, Balaam's in. How did Balaam end up? Well, we know if you read the story in the next chapter, Balaam does go and get with Balak and starts uh, getting uh, ready. He starts out his speech, but it turns out to be a blessing on Israel and a curse on Balak and Balak's not happy. Well, Balaam said, well, I told you, I could only speak what the Lord told me to speak. So let's try this, build some altars and, and we'll sacrifice some animals and we'll do it again. And once again, it, it happened that Balaam blessed the children of Israel that were there and, and Balak wasn't happy. And so after the third time, Balak said, that's enough is enough. Stop helping these people. And so, but we find out in the New Testament, what did Balaam do? Well, he still wanted to gain from the situation. So he came, he came up with the idea of what, it, what, what would happen. See, in 2 Peter 2.15, says he loved the wages of unrighteousness. I mean, that's speaking about Balaam. And so that, that tells you the reason why he did this. And he says, how are you going to destroy these people? Well, just like anytime you come up against a strong army, you can't really face them head on because they will defeat you. So what do you do? You got to sneak in and you got to go in by stealth. And so Balaam told Balak how to weaken Israel. Numbers 31 verse 16. And it was through idolatry and sexual immorality. We read about that in Numbers 25, one through three. This is what Balaam counseled him to do. Here's what you got to do, Balak. You send your pretty little girls and let them shake their booty in front of the eyes of these young men over there, and they're going to want to have some fun. Yeah, and that, that, that's really destructive. You know, this, this world operates on sexual pleasure, and you can tell just by the advertising and everything this world has to offer. And that's what Balaam counseled Balak to do. See, Balaam was killed along with the kings of Midian. We read that in Numbers 31 and verse 8. And that was mentioned uh, several times, like I say, and while they're recounting the history of, uh, of uh, Israel and what they had done. Yeah, he, he was killed there. And according to the scriptures, he died in dishonor and infamy. Jude 11 explains that. That's, that's what he did. And leaving out any part of God's word is dangerous. These are the lessons we learn. Leaving out any part of God's word is dangerous. God's will and purpose cannot be thwarted. We ought to know that. So God wills that people be saved. And if we don't help people be saved, God's not going to be pleased with us. And failing to appreciate our relationship with God can be a problem. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is the greatest relationship we have is with God. And if we blow that, I mean, we, we blow it all. And the danger of pursuing wealth. Yeah, there, there's another problem. When you're pursuing wealth, I mean, a lot of things suffer because of that. So there's another lesson we learn. And certainly these are all good lessons to be learned. So think about these things and um, consider them, share this message with others and uh, learn from it, profit from it and learn not to make the same mistakes that Balaam made. And you'll be following the instructions of Paul there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All right, so that's our lesson. Uh, have a good and blessed day. Do something for the Lord and uh, share this message and you'll be blessed for it. All right, bye-bye for now.